Welcome everybody to our session, Intentional Design, Crafting a Sustainable Internship Program. I'm Wendy Guerra, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Digital Initiatives Archivist at the University of Nebraska Libraries, Archives, and Special Collections. And I'm Claire Dulaney, I use she, her pronouns also, and I am the Outreach Archivist in the same department. And hi all, I am Lori Schwartz, I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Hegel and Technical Services Archivist here uh, in the same department. Before we begin, it is appropriate to acknowledge that UNO occupies the traditional treaty lands of the Omaha and the Ota Missouri tribal nations, whose sovereignty existed long before the state of Nebraska. We would also like to express our respect to the Ponca tribe of Nebraska, the Winnebago tribe of Nebraska, the Santee Sioux tribe of Nebraska, and over 170 other tribes represented within the Omaha area. Please take a moment to consider the legacies of more than 150 years of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival that brings us together today. At the University of Nebraska, we respect and seek out inclusion of differences, realizing that we can learn from each other, and we look forward to building long-lasting relationships with the indigenous people of Nebraska. To learn more about the NU Systems Initiatives, please visit UNL Native American Coalition. So while our presentation ultimately focuses on our new internship and practicum program, it was born out of the pandemic. You know, that part where we were all working from home five days a week in 2020 and then transitioning back. Well, our experiences were likely similar to many of yours, a rush of anticipation and preparation for working from home, the dawning realization of challenges ahead, some fumbling and stress as projects stalled, uh, some wins as projects move forward, and here we are. Once we were back on site enough to interact more, uh, Wendy, Claire, and I sort of jumped into this internship program project. We weren't charged with creating it. Uh, we saw a need and started working on it, and our boss was uh, supportive. We had all had casual conversations about the spontaneous nature of random interns and volunteers who reached out to us for placement just before and during the pandemic. Uh, bless them, but this random nature did result in our workload doubling without knowing ahead of time, and that really threw off our ability to plan and reach goals. So this effort that we're going to talk about was born out of necessity to fix the unsustainable method of random students and workload issues while also trying to make a better experience for our students. So one of the overarching themes of this work was building an ethically, so ethically conscious program. Over the last few years especially, there's been a lot of conversations around the topic of invisible labor and archival labor, student labor, and caring for those who are working with potentially harmful content. We wanted to integrate some of this thinking into our framework. It's one of the reasons that we prefer for students to be in a library or a library adjacent program and receiving course credit when completing their internship since we can't pay them. We also wanted to create a workspace where students had some agency in selecting the project areas and, se and any secondary projects, which we'll talk about later. Uh, it's really important to us that the students feel like their work matters and is visible within the department. These are just some of the areas we considered when creating the framework. So now we're each going to share the two years of intern experiences and projects in our areas of archival processing and digital initiatives and outreach before moving on to discuss how we went about designing our sustainable internship program and its various elements. We'll then share lessons we've learned and continue to learn um, during the initial two pilot phases and then with the interns who followed them before wrapping up um, with how we plan to continue moving forward. Okay, so I get to start. Um, as the Hegel and Technical Services Archivist, I manage a team of staff and students in arranging and describing the US Senator Chuck Hegel archives. And last year, I took over managing arrangement and description for all the department manuscript collections. Uh, the nature of the Hegel archives, uh, a collection of about a thousand cubic feet across many distinct series, has allowed me to assign projects from small to large and simple to complex uh, with the rest of the department's collection 
options now in, in the mix, I have uh, more possibilities. And you know, this variety benefits student employees and interns of all experience and education levels and time commitments, as you might expect. Um, during the virtual component of the pandemic, I supervised five students working on remote projects. I hired two student employees and supervised a practicum student in arranging and describing part of a digital collection. In the summer and fall of 2020, I hired two students, aware that remote work would require changes to orientation and training, obviously, so I quickly converted the training materials to be accessed remotely and revamped the orientation sheet. It turned out to be the perfect opportunity to drop off some unneeded elements of orientation. Then I decided what training to hold for on-site, like orientations to our space and hands-on training in the more complex elements of arrangement and description. I met with each student over Zoom to review required readings and provide a forest level view as best I could of collections and the arrangement process in general. Um, and then I focused in on description and our finding aid database archive space, which many of you are familiar with. I assigned these students to digital projects so they could switch out tasks during the long hours they were spending at home between both work and online classes, if you remember that, that part, pandemic. Uh, I emailed them once a week to gauge their progress and how they were doing in general. This did not always go smoothly as the students were juggling responsibilities and stress, uh, but it kept us moving forward. The practicum student who needed a virtual arrangement and description project for a graduate archives course ended up working on our Omaha COVID-19 collection. The department has other digital collections, obviously, but that collection was at the right stage to accommodate the students' course requirements. And I only needed a couple hours of prep to make it happen, which was key as there was little lead time. So it was done on the fly, which we've all experienced, and without the benefit of the start to finish structure of our new internship program, as we were still working out details at this point. Uh, the student did gain experience sorting individual files and creating a file structure and crafting folder titles and, and other description. I met with them on Zoom to orient them, talk challenges, teach them archive space uh, through which they would do the bulk of the description required by the practicum. Um, the student also had health issues during this time and that required extra flexibility. Then in fall 2021, uh, fast forward, we piloted our second student through the internship program. Uh, they're pictured here on the right. They arranged and described a collection in our Queer Omaha archives, uh, described and housed artifacts from the Hegel archives and completed several smaller secondary projects in outreach and digitization. They spent about 30 hours on outreach with Claire and 15 hours on digital initiatives with Wendy. And then finally, this year, I've had four interns who went through or are going through the program right now. They have given us the opportunity to see our program function beyond the pilot phase. So I started working with my first practicum student in the fall of 2020, and it kicked off a very busy year of managing remote projects for interns. Um, each student experience provided the opportunity to learn and implement better methods, and I built off of each one. With my first student, it felt a little bit like I was making things up as I went along, honestly. Um, but while I really did have a plan for their work and I intentionally communicated over Zoom and email to form a connection that wasn't really possible by email only, I felt there was a lot of room for improvement with my method of delivering instructions for digital projects. My student was able to complete basic metadata entry into our digital asset management system, Islandora, but I feel like their experience with me was rather shallow. So by the spring of 2021, I had a much better idea of the experience that I wanted to offer students, while also ensuring that their work was beneficial to the goals of the Archives and Special Collections Department. So when I took on my second student, working on an independent study for their MLIS program at LSU, I created a work plan and a schedule for the projects that they would complete, the skills they would learn, and the software that they would gain experience using during a set time frame. And while it took more work up front to design an approach that incorporated my on-site student scanning to create digital objects for the intern to work on remotely with trial versions of software, the outcome was significantly better than my first effort. The student was able to learn how to create mods records in Oxygen XML Editor and how to embed metadata in digital objects using trial versions of Adobe Suite. I provided instructions using email, Zoom, and then detailed tutorial uh, demonstrations that I made using Vigrid. 
With my third student joining me remotely from the University of Washington iSchool, I felt comfortable expanding their work plan to include a small project and connection with Claire to help round out their short internship with me. I used the same instruction methods in soccer trials as with my former student, with one change being the increase to the student's level of responsibility in software, um, oh, excuse me, and access in Islandora. Uh, initially, this was a bit of a stretch for me to give that student more trust in operating within our digital asset management system, but ultimately it went great and it expanded <clears throat> the learning opportunity for our students significantly. Uh, joining us in late May of last year, my fourth intern was our official first pilot effort. This hybrid student from Mizzou had a learning plan and schedule that included the main focus on digital initiatives paired with secondary projects with Lori and Claire, planned informational interviews with other library staff, a final presentation, and an exit interview. The hybrid nature of his work allowed him to work around his full-time job while gaining important hands-on experience with both physical and digital collections in the archives. Um, this work included processing, scanning, writing mods records, embedding metadata, and completing research for an outreach project. Instruction occurred in person, over email, and via video demos. Communication was quite extensive um, as we wanted a lot of feedback from him to help us improve for pilot number two. Um, lastly, the fifth student I worked with was primary Lori's intern, and that was the second pilot intern. Um, with this student, I only had 15 hours of project time, as Lori had mentioned, um, and we'll talk about that experience a little bit later on. So outreach serves as one access point for researchers to work with archival material. It's important that students working with me understand that outreach ties directly into digital collections, processing, um, as it's a key facet of collection discoverability. This has been and will continue to be a guiding principle as I move forward in this work. Uh, one of the reasons I was so engaged with crafting this intern program was to build up my own experience and proficiency in supervising students. I can create or implement small projects with some level of agility and short notice, but I didn't really have any experience as a long-term supervisor. So the first practicum student I worked with was something of a spontaneous addition to my workload. I was not supervising her directly, but in passing conversations, she expressed an interest in exhibit design and installation. She started a secondary project with me for our monthly display cases. I met with the student to discuss how we would go about selecting materials, creating labels, and installing the display. Within this small project, it was important that the student gained experience in using the catalog and finding aids, searching the stacks, and engaging with primary source materials. Additionally, it was important that there was trust in the interaction, as the student was rather nervous. While we worked on this project over the course of a few days, the student opened up about her college experience, some frustrations in the program, and hopes for next steps. I appreciated her frankness and the trust she placed in me as we worked together, and I hope that if she has questions in the future, she will reach out. Uh, this first image is of the case that she helped me curate. Um, for a grant student that I worked with, I was the only supervisor for this long-term and complex research and outreach project. This student had a little experience working with primary source material, but not a great deal of knowledge working in an archive. I wanted him to feel like he was part of the department team, at least intellectually, as he worked remotely. In an attempt to make the student feel welcomed, however, I completely overwhelmed him. Um, I assured him that we were working along ethical and compassionate lines during COVID, that I wanted to, him to find personal value and interest in the work. I ended up giving him too much freedom in selecting where he started his research. The student dove way too quickly into the materials and started drowning in specifics when he didn't have context. He produced piecemeal things, and I wasn't sure how to explain how they were wrong or incomplete. Thankfully, we were able to correct course. He and I talked about the larger programmatic deliverables, and I showed where his research would specifically influence and support this. Um, there have been other positive outcomes. He asked me to serve as a reference for his grad school applications, and the work he produced will help increase collection access and discoverability. Uh, the benefit of that student of that structure is evident in working with my third student, Lori, if you'd click, thank you. Uh, this pilot two student was supervised mainly by Lori, but had a secondary project in outreach with me and another with me Wendy, as we mentioned before. Um, before the student started, Lori shared the schedule and the number of hours that the student had with each of us. Lori asked Wendy and I to roughly map out the hours and tasks we would want to have the student work on. 
This simple document provided structure when invariably the student came to my office and said, ready to start. This student curated two flat case displays and created social media posts about the exhibit, items in our collection to celebrate LGBTQ plus history month in October, and posts about their work processing. I wanted this last set of posts, posts in particular to combat the idea of invisible archival labor and invisible student labor. Uh, the photo here shows the student with their case. For our two current fall 2022 interns, I am partially supervising them for outreach elements, including social media, exhibit installation, and for the first time shadowing instruction sessions. In my initial meeting with both interns, I shared the expectations of these outreach secondary projects, specifically the social media portion. Interns will create a few posts about the content of their work, the projects they liked, the collections they engaged with, etc. They are required, however, to write at least one post about the work that they are doing so that it's clear that collections aren't processed or finding aids aren't updated through invisible labor. This is an essential part of my contribution to our ethical framework. Student labor is highlighted, discussed, and celebrated. So far, both students have shadowed instruction sessions in our reading room. Before the classes, I confirmed with the students whether they would like to be introduced when I did my own introduction, and if they would like to help with any elements of the class, such, such as the Native Nations Acknowledgement or other discrete teaching elements. Both have declined on the latter, which is totally understandable, um, but I wanted to provide them with a little bit of agency and decision making. One of our main objectives for this presentation was to share with you the documentation we created for our internship program. The documents evolved over the course of our planning and they are still living documents that we update as needed. The six elements of our documentation are the internship program design document, which once finalized became a core piece of the application. Uh, there's also the learning plan, the learning objectives bank, a required reading list, exit interview questions, and the requirements for the final presentation. We're gonna walk you through these items in detail during this presentation and answer any specific questions you may have during the live Q&A. It does get slightly confusing when discussing the internship program design, which encompasses all six documents you see here, and the internship program design document, which was the document we used to brainstorm, organize, and finalize all the documents that we wanted to incorporate. We'll try to keep those two distinct during the walkthrough. Okay, so uh, when we jumped in, Claire, Wendy, and I all had our own ideas and experiences stemming from being interns ourselves back in the day and later as supervisors, and we knew we wanted our design to include empathy and be ethically informed. So on my part, so when I was a grad student, I had an official internship, a practicum, and random other practical experiences. A practicum was a whirlwind 60 hours teaming up with two classmates. Our supervisor checked in on us twice, and that included the intro, and we barely knew what we were doing. Uh, for my official three-hour credited internship, I interned at a state archives where I scanned photos and entered metadata. I stayed in one room, and there were no enrichment activities, and I didn't learn about the broader structure behind my work, save for 20 memorable minutes from my supervisor about digitization setup when I pestered him. I'm betting their internships are structured differently these days, but this is one reason why I was on board for bringing structure and well-roundedness to our internship design. I've supervised around 20 interns as a professional, and most of them haven't been part of an official program, but I suppose due to my earlier experience, I supplied all sorts of value-added components, probably talking my interns heads off as I gave them loads of contextual information about their projects, our archives, and the profession. Now, with this program design, uh, this whirlwind can be filtered through a structure. Um, I completed my MLIS entirely online while I also worked full time. And that situation required me to fit internship experiences around a really packed schedule and a very specific geographic region. Um, at the time, remote internships were few and far between, and I would even say rare. Uh, my best internship experience occurred within a formal program at a large historical society, starting with a competitive application process, and this was really good practice for the future. Um, it was guided by a learning plan, supplemented by informational interviews, and evaluated by a final presentation with my intern cohort. When Lori, Claire, and I started trying to figure out what elements we needed um, in our intern program, we each contributed several examples of programs that we admired. 
Uh, the elements in design were also influenced by our desire to create well-rounded experiences while understanding that students are only human and so are we. I'd say that one benefit of the pandemic um, is that we've learned that, that much of our work can be accommodated to be performed remotely, um, especially a majority of digital collections work. I entered into this design planning stage with the idea that I specifically wanted to ensure opportunities for people who might not be able to relocate or work that typical eight to five schedule. I suspect that the library and archives field misses out on a fair bit of talent that we weren't able to encourage or give opportunity to simply because people can't make on-site internships happen for any number of reasons. Uh, so with that in mind, um, I also felt very strongly about designing experiences that were beneficial to both the student and the archives and special collections department. It is easy to quickly get burnt out by adding um, additional projects onto our required work and our goals. Uh, my experiences definitely influenced my desire to create a primary project that could be done remotely during hours that could accommodate the reality of distant student schedules. Hence the reliance on trial software programs that can be you know, put on any computer and uh, cloud storage access from anywhere and our web-based digital asset management system. Um, so the two internships that I had as a student during and directly after grad school were great because they were both extremely well-rounded and I felt like I was part of the department and not just a grunt worker. These internships were both relatively self-directed. For the one during grad school, I was charged with a theme and a rough outline of an exhibit, but I had the freedom to map the contours of the work. Similarly, for the post-grad internship, I selected a track, but the programs within that track were of my choosing. I learned a great deal from both internships, but as far as deliverables were concerned, one internship was more successful because I had a supervisor that was very engaged. My second internship, I did a lot of daily work, but at the expense sometimes of those larger projects. It was really important that this UNO internship be well-rounded and include the glamorous as well as the more mundane daily activities that are necessary in any archives or special collections, like shelving. Those tasks were really actually important to me during these internships because it made me feel like I was part of the normal workforce, I got to know the collections, and I wasn't just a special projects person. So when we three actually sat down to design the program elements, we started out with this really complex track system with primary tracks and secondary tracks with optional side projects, depending on the number of hours the students were working. This became overly complicated with parsing out percentages of hours that could be worked, how students would indicate their track preferences during the application process, and how we would let applicants know what tracks were available depending on the archivist's availability. The bulk of our time and energy spent creating the program design was spent on moving away from the track system into a much more simplified format. We decided that it would be better for students to pick one area of focus, either digital collections, outreach, or processing, and then depending on the number of hours they worked, could incorporate secondary projects. This also allowed us flexibility during the program. If something came up for one of us, we can shift someone, some of the intern's time around, for example, incorporating more outreach work or assisting in other de departmental projects. The design document, um, as mentioned before, is the living document that we use to brainstorm and organize what we wanted for this program. Um, I wish we had a picture of the whiteboard um, of the first version where we tried to define the, percent define the percentages of times um, that could be allotted to those primary and secondary tracks, those side projects. Um, it was messy. It was also very fun. And it led us to, um, thankfully, a much more streamlined approach um, where there was one area of focus with a second area of possible projects. Um, this document is just for internal use and it's not shared with our students. The that you see here um, is what is the cleanup version. It's the most finalized version as it exists currently. Um, it's the template or the guide to the five other documents listed on the previous slide, as well as the online application. In the design document, there's an introduction to the internship program and briefly describing the department, the areas of focus, and what students can expect to gain from the program. In the eligibility section, we're very transparent about our desire for students to be in a library or library adjacent program um, that we cannot pay them. In an ideal world, we would love to pay our interns, um, which we'll talk more about that later. But when we were writing this and currently still, we don't have funds to pay students. In a slightly less ideal world, all of our interns would take an internship for credit so that they're at least getting something towards their degree. But we have to be aware of the realities of our profession 
Uh, students need internships, even if they can't take them for credit. Um, for credit or not for credit, we require our students to have a learning plan, um, which we will again talk about a little bit later. Um, additionally, uh, UNO may conduct a background check on our student workers, including our interns, if they're going to be on site. Um, this is a university policy, it's not an archives and special collections one, but we wanted our students to know that this is a possibility upon acceptance into the program. We also really needed students to know that we don't offer any housing options or funds for travel. Um, this was again one of the reasons that remote internships are a central part of our program. Uh, being as inclusive and accessible to the widest range of students is really, really important to us. So the application that we use is a Microsoft form and we will take a look at that next. And that um, formal application process is one element that we decided to institute for this program. Um, the image on our left, our, on your left is our working document. And the image on the right shows the final form available through our website. The application is intended to give students experience applying for jobs and to give us the information that we need to select students to work with us. Uh, we simply can't take on every student that seeks an internship with our repository. I'm sure that you've all experienced interns before who um, once they were on board, you sort of realized that they didn't perhaps have that intentionality that was needed for them to thrive um, or for either party to um, see any benefits from their time with you. Um, so our application process is intended to help prevent or decrease the chances of that happening and also to reduce the likelihood that we'll have more interns than we can handle at any one point. After launching the application, we did update the information to reflect that applicants will be reviewed on a rolling basis until we hit our maximum um, or our deadline. Uh, we spent a fair bit of time determining what to include in this application. Uh, it was important that students come to this internship with a sense of the work that they would be doing and how they will play a role in the overall functions of the department. Um, even if it's required by a library program, it is still a time commitment and we want students to be aware of the hours, the timelines, and the deadlines. Um, we hope that by sharing the website and the application with library program chairs and directors, um, we can avoid some of that last minute shuffling. Yeah, fingers crossed. Um, when, when creating this application, we tried very hard to set expectations for applicants, and this includes points we've already discussed, like no compensation or housing and required background checks. We also tried to be clear about submitting the learning plan, program requirements, or internship requirements from a student's academic program. Uh, every program out there has different goals and expectations for their internship components, uh, some specific and others quite vague we've discovered. Uh, we tried to clearly indicate that whatever information about your program that was available, we, we would like to receive it. One of the lengthier sections of the application is the description of elements of the internship and the areas of focus, which we spent a lot of time working on. We wanted prospective interns to know what their time with us would look like. We tried to explain the primary and secondary project possibilities in a way that was clear and not overwhelming orientation and readings, informational interviews, and an end of the internship presentation are all elements that the three of us felt very strongly about. Uh, regarding the informational interviews, our department is on a different floor from the rest of the library, and so it's easy for students to feel separated from the rest of academic library work. Our hope is that students will interview staff outside of archives when appropriate to understand how our work is connected. And finally, the final presentation, which I think Wendy will share more about later, has real benefits for our students. Not only does this ask them to reflect and explain their work and how it can be integrated into their schooling, uh, it gives them material to use for job interviews as well. So going back to the point about students understanding our expectations, we do require that students submit a CV and a cover letter. The CV will help us understand what relevant coursework the student has completed, and the cover letter will force the student to think about this as a job and not just a thing to be done for school. From previous experience of going over student application packets, it's fairly clear that most students don't know how to write a cover letter or a CV. For me, one resume in particular stands out as being completely aspirational, as opposed to showing what the student had actually accomplished. Um, to try and help students, we include links for writing CVs and cover letters in the application. This MOU or contract language where we ask students to confirm their understanding of the program allows us to have some expectation of the student's seriousness. We did originally have students upload the document directly through the Microsoft form. However, that wouldn't work for students outside of UNO. 
So now we have directions of how to email the cover letter and CV. This will also be a good test for following directions. We also have deadlines. The application dates are there to protect us in archives and special collections so that we have the ability to say no to applicants or program directors who email us after the deadline or even mid-semester. I would say we struggle with this because we have a deep empathy for students who need internships. We're gonna talk about the learning plan in a later slide. We keep promising this, I know, I promise we will get there. So I'm going to jump down to the orientation section. We require all students to go through a brief departmental orientation. This includes uh, required academic readings, the library student handbook, the archives and special collections student handbook, code of ethics from ACRL and SAA, tours of the department and library, and safety trainings for lockdowns, fires, and tornadoes. We also discuss issues of confidentiality, such as medical, legal, educational, and other types of sensitive information, and ask them to sign a form indicating their understanding. We follow a student training checklist to keep the orientation on track, and it is flexible enough to be used by both student employees and interns. So some grad school programs provide a learning plan. Oh, we're at the learning plan stage. Yeah, here we are, finally. <laughs> uh, um, so they provide um, program information on the learning plan, listing the expectations and requirements for their internship and practicum credits, um, while some schools don't. Uh, we built our learning plan to use when students do not have one provided by their program when they aren't completing the internship for credit um, or to supplement if we think that the school learning plan is maybe a little bit inadequate or a little bit vague. Um, so the learning plan is filled out by the primary supervisor and the student prior to the internship beginning. Sections of the learning plan include requirements from a student's program if they exist, um, the expected student schedule, and if they intend to be on site, remote, or hybrid, um, what prior students, what prior experience the student has, and the primary and secondary projects that will form the core of the internship. It's basically a roadmap for the internship. The final section includes the learning objectives we think will best support the work of the primary project and give the student a well-rounded experience. Now, the learning plan is for both the student and our benefit. Um, with the learning plan, expectations are clearly articulated, and if changes need to be made, we have that original documentation from which to evolve. For some elements of our internship design, our ideas shifted over time. The learning objectives are an example of this. Uh, for a learning plan, which would list learning objectives and the projects they would complete with us, we spent time discussing how vague versus specific the learning plan should be for students that did not have a plan from their academic institution. For example, we had one intern whose program had a very basic plan. The learning objectives on another intern's learning plan were so broad as to be useless for their purposes and ours. I mean, they likely had a, a purpose in the larger library department, um, but not so much for our student. Um, so we wanted the learning plan and those objectives to guide student work and ensure their projects had tangible results and resulted in learned skills. And we wanted the learning objectives to be obtainable and useful. Uh, we've listed some examples of the learning objectives here, which we currently keep in a Word doc that we update as needed. It's one of those six documents. We have objectives that relate generally to archives and the archival profession, um, as well as area specific objectives in outreach processing and digital collections. So when I filled out learning plans with my latest two interns, um, it was easy for me to open our learning objectives bank, select the objectives that fit the project and boom, done. We wanted to use required readings to prepare students for their internship with us and to fill in any gaps from our specific areas of expertise that a student may have not been exposed to in their formal coursework. This would help all interns, or this was intended to help all interns um, start on a more level playing field. Eventually, we'd like to have interns form cohorts each semester that, each semester that promote deeper engagement and learning. Um, this is still an idea though. You know, we, we're, we're taking, taking it as it comes here. So some of the books that we selected readings from are displayed on the screen. We also selected readings that we felt were important in our areas of expertise, as well as basic and more advanced materials that cover the archival profession as a whole. Required reading materials can be adjusted based on what an intern has been exposed to previously, although I've definitely asked interns to revisit some articles 
that they told me they had already covered early in grad school. So I'm like, hey, a refresher is always a good idea. I actually had an intern tell me that very recently. They willingly reread an article. So I, that was great. Look at that progress. Yeah. Um, to round out the required elements, we wanted our interns to give a final presentation and take part in an exit interview. We saw the exit interview as a meaningful tool for reflection during which we could provide feedback about their projects and offer insight for how these experiences can be applied to their careers. Of course, we also wanna hear from them about what was meaningful, what did and didn't help them understand the projects we asked them to complete and so on. So we've listed some of our questions uh, that we use in that exit interview. Likewise, the final presentation helps the student reflect on their work and understand their takeaway from the internship like what they can add to their resume, how the work accomplished their learning objectives, and what can be applied to their coursework or future employment. We've listed here some of the questions from the exit interview and the requirements of the final presentation. Um, you can see how on the right uh, that we are specific in our instructions for the final presentation because Lori had a couple of students who were very, very nervous about it. And these instructions helped reduce their anxiety. Your story. Okay, so let's talk now about lessons we learned before and during the pilot phase, yay, and all that we're continuing to learn in 2022. So my first lesson goes back to our first pilot. Uh, with them, I had uh, something pretty simple reinforced uh, that it's hard to estimate processing times, which shouldn't come as a surprise to some of you. Um, even if I have students work on a simple set of processing steps, students wrap their minds around it at different speeds. Uh, I can say that with certainty after 18 years of teaching processing to students. Um, with our first pilot intern, I estimated what someone with no experience could get trained on and accomplish in just 15 hours. They weren't able to finish all the elements of processing from inventory to full description. For the next short project like this, for an intern, I will pare down expectations so that the intern sees a final product from their efforts. Uh, can I teach all the steps of processing with a much smaller amount of material? Yes. If the intern turns out to be speedy, I can find an hour or two of work to supplement at the end if needed. But no matter what, they'll walk away with a sense of accomplishment and a vision for all the steps of processing. Something I learned and relearned is to write things down. If I have a meeting with a student about a secondary project, I need to send an email repeating the project, sharing links, and giving timeframes. Pilot One wasn't a student at UNO, so access to certain documents was tricky in the beginning. There were no problems with project expectations or timeline for the student, but needing to send out multiple emails for document permissions made me realize it would better, be better to just share a project template. Um, I decided that my second pilot intern would benefit from precise scheduling. They had 140 hours to complete and were scheduled for 15 hours each of outreach and digitization aside from their primary processing projects. I built out a schedule with input from Claire and Wendy on how much time to spend each day on which projects when we could. Um, I did not schedule times within each day or send calendar invites, which seemed like overkill. Um, even then, we ran into some schedule squishiness. Um, they were scheduled for outreach work many days in a row, and as the days added up, the, their time spent in outreach went over bit by bit until they had doubled their time by the end. Now, I felt the intern was reaping benefits from this time, and Claire wasn't complaining, but that's mainly because she didn't know that was happening, so I didn't say anything. However, my decision to not say anything hampered my planning for the intern's other projects, so I should have checked in sooner to better gauge the remaining time and plan ahead accordingly. So on that note, social media took way longer than I or Lori anticipated, mainly because I assumed the student was following the hours allotted on their schedule, so I didn't really check in with them. Uh, it will be good to compare the original calendar, the actual hours, and how we want to adjust the time frame for future interns. Similar to the project follow-up template, I need to make a social media template for the students to follow. The intern that crafted various posts had great content, but the posts were too long, contained bullet points, and links to photo in their personal Google Drive that I couldn't access when the time came to post. My lesson again is to make templates. I don't mean anything prescriptive. It doesn't serve me or the intern to ghostwrite the posts or exhibits, but providing clear expectations surrounding word or character count, finding a balance between educative text and context of the item, and the number of images that should be uploaded, I think would help things run more smoothly. 
the second pilot intern was the shortest amount of time that I had worked with a student and I dramatically overestimated how much content was reasonable to cover in a 15 hour secondary project. Uh, so while I was able to teach that intern everything from scanning through post production to ingest into our digital asset management system, I felt it was rather shallow experience for them, and it was one that put a lot of pressure on me um, in the days surrounding their work. Um, so in the future, I will aim to provide a deeper experience in one or maybe two areas um, of the digital initiatives or digital projects realm um, in the hopes of allowing a student to actually gain familiarity with the process like a deeper familiarity, instead of just briefly trying to cover everything I can with an intern and only really providing them an awareness of the work that I do. When our second pilot intern did their final presentation and exit interview um, at the end of last year, I was a bit nervous. As a supervisor, you never want to hear anything surprising in how an intern is describing the work they did or challenges they encountered, uh, but this didn't happen here, thankfully. What I learned was that the student picked up some missing knowledge from the readings and found the structure of the program helpful. Internal communication is going to be key to the success of this program. The point about outreach hours creep is a good reminder that this program can only function if we three are communicative, honest, and receptive to scheduling. The empathy and respect we want our students to experience must be extended to the three of us as well. Okay, uh, more lessons learned. Um, with our four interns in 2022, we saw our full application process in action for the first time, uh, and it worked as we hoped. I know we were all pleased that the two spring 2022 interns who were in our university's undergrad library program followed our application directions, submitted their materials on time, and produced decent cover letters and resumes. They later told me that they used the resources we provided to craft their cover letters and resumes, which was nice to hear. Um, the grad interns didn't need those hints, but the undergrad students did, at least in our sample of four. After receiving their application materials, we determined I would be their likely primary supervisor based on their interests and our availability. Then I set up meetings with each student we discussed the elements of the practicum, filled in the learning plan, discussed scheduling and other logistical issues, and addressed questions. I found those meetings to be really helpful in setting expectations and even in building their excitement for the internship experience. One of the most valuable pieces of feedback we received from our first pilot intern was how truly critical hands-on experience is to being successful in the job market. Uh, we probably already all know this. We've likely all lived those experiences of multiple internships to gain enough experience to pair with our formal education to get our foot in the door. And um, yet despite knowing that, it was valuable to have reinforced. Um, from the first pilot intern, we heard that the largest gap in what I have to offer professionally was practical experience, which I received in droves here. They also said, this exit interview, the presentation, and the practicum as a whole are the best possible preparation I could ask for. Um, the experience was clear, clearly critical for them uh, because they were hired within UNO libraries a few months after their internship and attribute their success to having gained that practical experience. Yay. Mm -hmm. uh, this had actually happened with my on the fly practicum virtual only intern as well. But we don't always hire our interns with limited archival budgets. Of course we don't. But you never know what expectations a student may bring with them. No matter the expectations we may try to set at the beginning of the internship, you will have to manage expectations as you go as well. Uh, for example, with one intern, uh, this involved a job opportunity and a realization that maybe archival work wasn't quite what they expected. Um, during their first 30 hours, this one intern, I had long discussions with them about processing and collection management, during which they seemed um, engaged and, and, and enthused, truly. Um, they were also very diligent about their project work. Uh, but then about halfway through the internship, they applied for a grant-funded staff position uh, in my department, but they were up against people with more relevant experience who were also known quantities to us. So in other words, it was a tough decision. I spoke with this intern in private about where their application stood so they would not so they would hear straight from me and not the grapevine or like an impersonal HR response. Their reaction in person was polite, but their reaction in emails was not. Uh, they said they hadn't really enjoyed the work. We're now considering another area of library work entirely. 
The fact that they were saying this soon after pinning an enthusiastic cover letter for the Archival job aside threw me a bit. It was also incongruent with my experience of them. Then they said they wouldn't even put the internship on their resume. <laughs> they also said other things, but in any case, I suspected they were hurt and lashing out. So I followed up with gentle questions and reminders, along with some resume advice, and waited for the exit interview to have a broader conversation. Suffice to say, I was more nervous for this exit interview than I was with my pilot intern. By the time it came, however, they had cooled down and reconsidered their statements. Though I had to be direct at times, we ended up having a pleasant talk about resumes and the hiring process, public library work, and where they might head post-graduation. Speaking directly as a supervisor can be awkward, but it's also my responsibility while helping prepare students for their professional lives. Um, at least this is what I repeat to myself. The other very concrete lesson learned from this was that Claire and I decided to add language to our application materials about internships not being a guarantee of a job. And then with another intern, I found myself managing expectations related to their academic supervisor and the importance of sticking to the learning plan came into focus. The intern felt pressured mid-internship by a supervisor in their grad program to spend more time on digital initiatives than we had all agreed to. Uh, however, Wendy didn't have more time to give, and for the sustainability of our internship program, we were determined to stick to the learning plans where possible so that our schedules don't get warped by external pressures. I ended up coaching the intern about how they could explain to their supervisor that learning to process and learning the ins and outs of our online database, a database used by thousands of archives across the U.S., were also valuable elements of archival work. In other words, for this internship, the learning plan helped set and manage expectations. Finally, I'm continuing to learn lessons about scheduling, including with my two current interns. What may have worked or sort of worked for my pilot intern last year wouldn't necessarily work for one of my 2022 interns. Uh, for one thing, my last five interns were with our department for 60, 60, like 130, 140, and 180 hours. Um, and they all had different combinations of primary and secondary projects. The scheduling has to bend to the parameters of each internship, but I may have more lessons learned when my two current interns leave in two months. Oh, when, you... <clears throat> when, sorry, caught it. <laughs> Still, 2022. Uh, when we started out, it felt a bit like we were laying the track to follow uh, immediately before we crossed it. Um, our intent, though, in creating this formalized program was sustainable work for all people involved, founded on empathetic labor practices. We've learned a lot and expect to continue learning how to provide mutually beneficial internship experiences. The ethics of unpaid students labor are difficult to navigate. On one hand, there is the reality that you can't get a job in this field without experience, and that experience is more often than not from unpaid labor, which has many issues um, of contributing to a skewed workforce based on who's capable of working for free. While on the other hand, you have this intensifying awareness and effort to change the practice of unpaid intern labor. It's a difficult situation that we're trying to navigate by requiring that our interns are enrolled in fieldwork or internship credit hours for school. Now, I say required, but it's really a preference. But it's our preference. Um, additionally, we haven't historically advertised that we're seeking interns. This changed a little bit, though, with the creation of our website. Um, it further changed when I made connections with advisors at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and at UW-Milwaukee. While the primary goal of connecting with those advisors was to make um, SLIS students aware of UNO as an option for fieldwork. It has just recently resulted in a student seeking experience, but not for credit, also outside of the deadlines. So like we said, we have, we struggle for we, <laughs> a little bit. Um, this is the second student who is seeking such an experience. The first was my student from the Washington I School. Obviously, I took that first student on. With this second student, I discussed with Claire and Lori, and we determined that when such requests arise, as they inevitably will, we'll handle them on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'm currently in the process of determining what projects and timeline that UWM student is interested in before fully committing to taking them on as an intern. Um, part of the sustainability piece that we, the archivists, must have um, the capacity, capacity to support interns and provide meaningful and mutually beneficial projects. 
And speaking of that, um, I don't feel comfortable, and I know Claire and Wendy are the same, bringing on an intern if uh, we can't give them a meaningful experience. If my boss says they could do X project, but I know that X project wouldn't give the student a substantive learning experience, if they would be like a clerk on a simple archival rehousing project, I'd nix it, no question. It wouldn't uh, feel ethical otherwise. Um, in addition to the considerations of credit versus no credit and wanting them to have a substantial learning experience, uh, we also don't want to use interns to do the work student employees would normally do. Uh, perhaps these considerations are magnified because we don't have funds to pay them, though I'd like to think we'd have similar thinking no matter. We are making a little headway in finding funds, though paying interns uh, Paying interns from our own university recently became the top priority in fundraising for one of our big private funding sources. So we'll see what happens this fall. Fingers all the way crossed on that one. Hmm. Um, also, providing meaningful and mutually beneficial projects isn't always so easy to determine. Um, a recent intern came to me past our dead application deadline. Wendy mentioned, but I wanted to make it work for a variety of reasons. One being they needed something in person in our city of limited archival options. But they also needed 135 hours ish of graduate level work. Um, and I had another grad intern already lined up who needed 180 hours. Uh, plus, I had the rest of my job. Um, and I knew that, you know, these interns would take a lot of time. So this is where transparency and sustainability can collide. A colleague and I have been surveying our collections recently, and we've identified a bunch of tiny projects in our stacks. It makes them sound cute. Uh, mm -hmm. Think along the lines of enhanced description, rehousing material, and so on. If I started this late applying intern on these easier projects, I could make my September work. So that's what I decided. Then we'd ramp up to more difficult projects from there, though I may never give him a from scratch project. I wanted to explain this to the intern up front, and he readily agreed. Transparency was important to me in that moment. And honestly, being a good supervisor and starting an effective mentoring relationship starts with transparency. Related to that, I swear that every intern or student teaches this to me anew. We have to approach mentoring differently for every student. They come to us at different stages of life and with differing amounts of support, privilege, knowledge, skills, natural ability, personalities, et cetera. Um, for the supervisor, navigating this takes emotional energy, which takes time, like literal time, as we think through their needs and our approach. We're gaining new insights every semester as we continue in our program. So what you've just heard is, of, is our as of September 2022 highlights. We hope they've been helpful or useful to you in some way. Finally, we hope that by intentionally designing a sustainable internship program grounded in ethical behavior and empathy, we can successfully attract students who wish to gain practical experiences while contributing to a mutually beneficial projects in our department. And that wraps us up. Thank you so much for uh, watching our video. We hope to see you in our live Q&A during the annual meeting, and we hope the rest of your conference goes well.